Mankind has experienced many issues with technological and infrastructure disasters throughout our history. From the failings of not-so-well-built ships, dams bursting, city-wide blackouts, to fires raging through the streets of London. We've seen it all, and some of it is more predictable than others, but no matter what, with technology comes the issue of human error. Which is always likely. However, in the 20th century, we saw a rapid advance in our technology, specifically within information technology. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, the computer. But even with how great computers are, they have many, many flaws. But what happens when you integrate technology so much into your society that society fully depends on it? Well, that means that when the technology goes, so does society. And that was something that almost happened. Or did it? <laughs> the, the event that we're going to talk about today is something that a lot of people seem to either exaggerate or underestimate, or they have the completely wrong idea about what actually went down. So, let's talk about an event that had IT technicians all over the world scrambling to avoid disaster. The Y2K bug. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> we are all creatures of habit and bad habits can derail us from true enjoyment in life. But what if I were to tell you that there was a better path to good habits? Yes indeed, and that is where today's sponsor comes in, Fume. Fume is a flavoured air device that aims to tread that better path and hopefully help you to tread it too. And before you say no, this isn't some dude bro hokey pokey sigma male supplements or a kaleidoscope of cold war chemicals for you to suckle on, this flavoured air device is refined and more importantly simple. With all natural flavourings and an elegant wood finish, you too could feel like a bespoke gentleman. Don't let the simplicity fool you, however, as Fume actually has quite the variety of flavours for us to enjoy. My personal favourite at the moment being Raspberry Lemon, because I do tend to be a bit zesty after all. I need to start reviewing these before I read them. However, if you don't swing that way, I, I really need to start reviewing these before I read them. But anyway, don't worry, as they have such flavours as maple pepper, white cranberry, and even a crisp mint one. Spoiled for choice, indeed. With a magnetised base and specialised airflow valve system, Fume really is the ideal way to finally break out of that vice and start treading that better path. And let me tell you, Sucking on wood has never felt this good or natural. Right, I'm new, new, new rule around the office. I'm reviewing these before I read them. Oh, is it funny? It's funny, aye. Helping over 150,000 customers with thousands of success stories, Fume is leading the way in finally taking that first step to a better tomorrow, and you could too. So head to tryfume.com slash dankula, or scan the QR code on the screen, and use code dankula to get 10% off when you buy the journey pack today. Some of the older generation that are watching right now may very well know of the Y2K bug. And no, it wasn't some pre-COVID pandemic that was spreading globally, but instead, a critical problem with computers across the globe. Now, we very briefly touched on this issue in the dot-com bubble video, which can give you some good background into the issue. But I'll still give you guys a brief rundown later in the video. But for starters, we need to establish the classic who, what and where of the Y2K bug, because it wasn't exactly a new issue. So for starters, what exactly is the Y2K bug? Well, the name itself comes from the term year 2000. Y2K is just an abbreviation of the year 2000 bug. 
The reason the bug was given this name is because the bug itself stems from a system error that would be caused by computers' internal clocks hitting the year 2000. Pretty self-explanatory. But what was the fuss with the year 2000? Why would that be a problem? Surely these modern machines could handle something as simple as the 31st of December becoming the 1st of January. Well, they couldn't. <laughs> you see, there was a critical issue with computers in the way that they processed data, specifically with calendar data above the year 1999. Although we take computers for granted and everything usually works fine for the most part, their overall design and architecture are actually pretty old. Now, I won't sit here and give you an introductory course into the entire history of computers, but I'll briefly sum up why these initial designs from the inception of computers ended up causing a lot of problems. Basically, when computers were first being developed in the mid-1900s, the need to format dates past the 1990s was just... never considered. Because those dates were so far away that they just didn't worry about it. As for how computers process dates, when we humans look at a calendar year, we read all of the digits. So for 2024, we see that as four characters. But if I handed you a human, let's say, a paper invoice with the year written in shorthand, for example, if it said 3rd of January 24, you would see the context and know that it meant 2024. You wouldn't think that this was an invoice from 1924 or 1824, so on and so on. Because you, a human, can recognise context. But computers don't have context. They are logical devices. They don't infer, they take information that they see literally. Maybe now they can infer a little, but back then they couldn't at all. Therefore, everything a computer handles is pretty strict and straightforward. Basically, computers are the technological equivalent to your very autistic friend. You might tell him to take a seat with the intention of him sitting down, but instead he literally takes the seat. Now, you might be thinking, dank, that's really fucking stupid. If these computer scientists were so smart, why would they ever develop a system like that? Well, they weren't exactly being stupid, they were being logical. Because all of this was an attempt to try and save computer resources. You see, in the early days of computing, there was very little memory space on devices, alongside memory costing a fortune, be that both in physical space and in money. For example, in the 1980s, a 10 megabyte, so that's not 10 gigabyte, 10 megabyte hard drive would set you back about $3,400. So the computer scientists decided to code computers into thinking that any two digit year they saw was in the 1900s. If it saw 63, it was read as 1963. If it saw 77, it was read as 1977. By removing these first two digits, the scientists would save on processing time and power. Things that mattered very, very much on these older machines that didn't have a lot of either. The technology was still in its infancy, so anything that could reduce the load was reduced. So, if the computers are coded to do this, what would happen once they hit the year 2000? Ah, that's ages away. Don't worry about it. But time only moves in one direction, so eventually we were going to hit the year 2000. Since the calendar would change to 2000, the last two digits read would be 00. zero. So that could mean anything. The computer might read that as the year 1900, maybe it would return a null value, or maybe the computer would just go, I don't know what to do, and just crash. So, yeah, removing the processing time of those two digits was necessary back in the 60s and 70s where hardware was so shit that removing the processing need for a single digit really did make a huge difference. But it's 1999 now. Computer technology has come a long way since then, so why wasn't this issue just fixed when the technology improved? 
Well, at the time, that's what computer engineers were thinking as well. Since they knew that this could be a potential issue, they had presumed that another technology would be made or things would change by the time this would become an issue. But a new technology didn't exactly come along. After all, the original laws and codes and building blocks of computing itself that pretty much every single system was built on had already been written. Why would we want to do all of that work all over again? Why would we want to make a brand new technology? What we have already works just fine. The best way to look at it is like this. Picture computing being like constructing a building. The rules of computing software, hardware, operating systems, circuit boards, logic gates, etc, etc were all established, which created the set of rules of how computing works. This is the way computing works because this is the way that we designed it, meaning that all future systems built on top of this foundation will all follow these same rules. This built the foundation of the building, the foundation of computing. And every advancement of computing was a new floor being built on top of this foundation. And each floor all followed the same rules, including that little rule about dates. So each new floor that was being added was fancier and faster and had more memory and processing power than the floor before it. And more and more floors were all being added and all being added and getting fancier and faster and so on and so on and so on. But they were all built on top of the same foundation, all following the exact same rules set by that foundation. Well, the foundation had a crack in it. But surely someone would notice this issue before it became a genuine concern. And yes, there were a few people that actually did notice it. Almost 20 years before the Y2K bug would actually strike, two people named Jerome and Marilyn Murray actually noticed this error while they were working at an insurance firm by entering a specific due date after the year 2000. This caused the software to basically freak out as it read the date as sometime in the early 1900s versus the actual intended date. From there, Marilyn and her husband Jerome wrote a book discussing the issue called Computers in Crisis. But even earlier than that, one of the most notable computer scientists around the formation of these early systems, Bob Beamer, actually tried to intervene in the issue as early as the 1970s. But sadly, his efforts were largely ignored. And it wouldn't be until 20 years later that people would eventually ask him for help. Now, you might be thinking, oh come on Dank, surely this couldn't have been as much of an issue as it's being made out to be. You know, a little issue with the date. Surely some coders could just go in there and edit some lines of code and everything will be fine. Well, no, it doesn't fucking work like that and it's not that easy. There were several issues with the Y2K bug, especially with how to solve it. First, let's imagine the scope of computers. This issue didn't just affect your basic home computer, this affected everything. Aircraft equipment, power stations of every kind, home appliances, banking systems, hospital systems, to name just a few. Almost everything you can think of has computers involved somewhere down the line. Of course, not everything would be a complete disaster. Like, if an insurance company's computers went down, not great, but also not terrible. But if a power plant or a hospital's computers went down, well, that's a pretty fucking serious issue. So, it was a genuine concern and it had to be fixed. But the panic really set in because everyone had left it until the 90s to actually try and solve the problem. When you've got so many industries and pieces of infrastructure being affected at several layers all across the globe, this wouldn't just be an overnight fix. It would end up turning into a race. But besides the panic of everything failing, it wouldn't be made any better by the absolute fear-mongering spewed out by the media. All of a sudden, everyone was worried about planes falling from the sky, nukes being set off everywhere, and a complete collapse of society. This was one of the biggest problems with Y2K. 
the fear-mongering and the misinformation. Did you know that lots of people still to this day think that Y2K was a virus created by someone? That some supervillain hacker created a Y2K virus and made some announcement like People of Gotham City at exactly midnight tonight Blah 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 Like it wasn't a virus Right, it was a bug A bug that at the time wasn't causing problems But now it was going to cause problems. Also, the media really over-exaggerating with the fear-mongering. I mean, like, yeah, Y2K did have the potential to be really bad, but not as bad as the media were making it out to be. But still pretty bad. Almost everything was at risk, and most people were clueless as to what would actually happen. But people, or more so technicians and governments, had to act fast. But the newspapers were putting everyone into panic mode, which really didn't help. So if you've got experts, and particularly tabloids, blowing shit up and telling everyone that the apocalypse is about to happen, people of course will take particular measures to try and protect themselves. <laughs> That's a sound that gets your attention real quick. As you can imagine, in the United States, there was a spike in gun sales as Americans sought post-Y2K guns. The firearms industry was, of course, absolutely drilling at the mouth of the idea of a potential apocalyptic scenario, since it would be very easy for them to tout off various weapons, claiming that these guns were ready for the Y2K apocalypse. I mean, people were literally just putting stickers on anything and claiming it was Y2K proof. Guns don't use computers. So, what the fuck did they have to do with a computer bug? Oh no, my gun has crashed, I have to switch it off and back on again. Th this isn't cyberpunk. But it wasn't just firearms. There were even Y2K survival guides. Another example of people taking advantage of the panic. But hey, if you aren't one for reading a long arse survival book, you could always grab a Y2K survival VHS, covering what could happen and what you need to do if anything goes wrong. And if you didn't hear enough about it in the newspapers, don't worry since everything else has you covered. Plenty of TV shows at the time were discussing the issue, there were songs and even movies made about it. So yeah, I don't really blame people for getting so worried about some sort of cyber apocalypse coming around the corner, especially with the media pushing the fear mongering so much. And of course, you also had plenty of religious Y2K doomsday cults popping up all over the place. Of course, most of the sensationalism around this issue would be focused in the United States. But it wasn't just the United States that discussed the issue. In the UK, we had a bit more of a satirical approach to it. These prices are going backwards, the cheaper than last year. You don't suppose it's that millennium bug, do you? Give us your phone. It wouldn't be fair of me to frame the United States like they were the only ones going bonkers over nothing, but we in the UK did take it seriously, with the Labour government at the time setting up the project known as Action 2000. Act now. Call 0845 601 2000 for your free action pack. This programme was designed, alongside many others across the globe, to combat the issue of the Y2K bug, since more and more officials were catching on to how big of a problem this could potentially cause nationwide. I mean, they really were trying to warn people, but not in a panicky, the end is nigh kind of way, much more in a, hey, get your shit sorted kind of way. But, of course, this calmer, reasonable message had to compete with the sheer amount of scaremongering coming from the media. To be fair, not all of the United States media coverage was purely focused on scaring the public, but companies did of course use it as a means of advertising. Like how antiviruses were saying, worried about Y2K? Then buy our antivirus. Why? Y2K wasn't a virus. It was a bug within the foundational structure of computing itself. Was McAfee going to rewrite... I mean, he probably could. He probably could have done it a lot better, but I'm just saying, right? Antiviruses had absolutely nothing to do with Y2K. 
but there were a lot of them using Y2K as a way of advertising. Or like that advert that Nike put out, which kind of summed up what people thought would actually happen when Y2K dropped. But sometimes good intentions turn out bad. And with all of the warnings of stocking up on food, saving up on water and so on, this caused a false issue within itself. You see, when there is no crisis, but you tell people, hey, you know, just to be safe, you might want to stock up on X, Y, Z, and then everyone all at once goes out, filling up their bathtubs with water, buying all of the toilet paper and all of the tinned food and so on, then you do end up with the same issues that we saw during COVID. People were screaming about shortages when there wasn't really any shortages of materials. There was plenty of materials to create the things that people wanted to buy. Production just couldn't keep up with demand. There weren't any actual shortages, but when people start buying way more shit than they actually need to buy, it can create a sort of shortage. A production shortage isn't really that bad. A materials shortage, however, well, yeah, we are, we are approaching doomsday if that's the case. Now, as far as I've seen, it wasn't as bad as compared to COVID, but those false shortages were another potential issue that could have sprouted from the Y2K bug before the bug itself had even caused any problems. Thankfully, people were somewhat reasonable, but it did take a fair bit of warning to tell people, hey, there aren't going to be any food shortages, so don't go out and stock up on shit. But I don't really blame people if they didn't listen, because, well... It's still the government after all. So yeah, you did still have people buying bunkers and going full Mad Max mode. But how was all of this going to be fixed? Where would you even start? Well, as we briefly mentioned earlier, governments all across the globe would implement specific Y2K management groups to tackle these issues. These groups were tasked with educating industries on how to fix the problem, identifying what needed to be fixed, and of course, trying to fix these things as soon as they could. I know it sounds like I'm being general, but the issue itself was pretty general and ubiquitous. It wasn't just standard computers that were affected. There were plenty of harder-to-get computer devices that utilised these calendar functions. For example, embedded chips on a variety of devices couldn't easily be fixed since a lot of them were hard-coded compared to other devices like your home computer where a software update could solve the issue. But some of these devices couldn't be updated. These microchips, whatever code was written on them, that's what was written on them. They didn't have the ability to be updated. So for things like monitoring devices in nuclear plants and underground pipelines to machines that were being used in factories, all you had to do was go in there and swap out the chips. Simple enough, except that there was literally millions of them all over the world, probably, probably hundreds of millions maybe, probably hundreds of millions that all needed to be swapped out. And they weren't all easy to get to, like just walking through the door of a factory and walking up to a machine. Because other things that used these types of chips included satellites, which are, are a little bit tricky to get to. You know, like, I don't know, maybe you could do it. I'll get a ladder. Let's, we'll give it a bash and see how we get on. So these teams were needed not just to help identify the problematic devices, but also come up with solutions on how to actually get to the devices so that they could then remediate these older chips. I mean, we still see it today in devices initially made over 10 plus years ago, which are all still commonly used. Again, I know you might be thinking, surely this could only be in a minority of cases. Well, even today we see plenty of large-scale operations from the government, hospitals, and even billion-dollar companies are slow to implement updates to their infrastructure. That's just the way things are in life. I'm sure we've all experienced this in some way or another. Either people don't want to spend all of the cash to rip out and install new things after they spent so much time and money setting up their original hardware. 
Or people are just happy with the older equipment that they have. But sooner or later, it comes to bite them in the arse, since too many of us are much more concerned with the now rather than the later. So you have several issues with fixing the bug. You need to get proper access to the device and some are much more easy to access than others. Sometimes the hardware or software may be very old itself or worse, whoever actually designed the hardware or the software just isn't around anymore. And no one has any idea how this old shit works. This is when you had cases of old programmers coming out of retirement to come and fix issues on code that barely anyone uses anymore. So these guys were the best people to get a hold of. It was like Isaac Asimov's foundation. No one knew how this old shit worked anymore. But unlike foundation, the guys who built it were fortunately still alive. So they get called in to fix all of these old problems on old software using some ancient coding language that no one used anymore. This, along with a mixture of newer technicians, would start a global effort to strip out old systems, rewrite code, and of course test that things would function properly. Although not everyone was on board with the worry of the Y2K bug, and some experts believed that the issue would be minor at best. But of course, the media very rarely covered these arguments because that didn't support the fear-mongering narrative. But it wasn't just the media that was causing issues with the public. There were plenty of accounts of Y2K-related crimes, especially around fraud. Do you think we've got it bad today with the classic calls from telephone scammers? Well, Y2K was a perfect excuse to call up people claiming to be Rajneesh from Microsoft Technical Support here to help you today to protect your computer from Y2K. With the real intention of stealing credentials or money from unknowing or confused people. But let's not give the Indian subcontinent a bad rep just yet, since they actually played a massive part in helping with the Y2K bug. At the time of the crisis, there was a drastic need for computer technicians, specifically programmers. With millions of lines of code to get through, it wasn't going to be easy for just the United States to do that on its own. So with that, a lot of outsourcing went to India. And with such a large population, and with a lot of workers within the IT sector, India helped fucking massively with tackling the Y2K bug. Everyone might shit on India for various reasons. Indian people very often do that themselves, but even to this day, one of their greatest assets is within IT. And it's not just within call centres either, but that's a topic for another time. So basically, behind the scenes of all of the worrying and potential chaos, IT workers all across the globe worked every second they could to fix these issues. Flash forward to 1999, and it was time. Was the world going to end? Was society going to collapse? Will I lose access to all of my porn and be forced to speak to real women? Well, you obviously all know by this point that none of those things happened. All of those home kits, Y2K proof computers, Y2K proof guns, self-help guides and so on apparently did nothing major. It was all a hoax. It was a complete nothing burger, a lie, a bamboozle, or so people thought. Now, there have been debates from both sides about the true severity of Y2K and the potential issues it could have caused if these precautions weren't put in place. So, what problems did Y2K actually cause to systems that had not been updated in time? Well, nothing too major from what it seemed. There were a few cases of flight information failing for a few airports alongside some travel issues across the world. Things like certain ticket machines didn't work, people couldn't get their tickets processed, and so on and so on. So, no, there weren't exactly planes falling from the sky and trains crashing into each other, but there was travel disruption across the world. Just not major disruption. There were plenty of failures, with 99% of them being nothing too critical, and with most of them being quite funny, to be honest. 
But what about the banks? Surely they had issues. And yes, they actually did. But with small things like credit cards not working properly. But most of those issues were fixed within a few days. Although, for one man in Germany, he was temporarily a millionaire because when he checked his bank account, it displayed that he had savings of over six million dollars. But sadly for him, that was then rectified to the correct amount. So it can be done. <laughs> <coughs> that was a joke, I'm sorry. Imagine that. Living in Germany, not too long after the Iron Curtain had fallen and things probably being a bit dreary, then boom, six million in your account just for it to vanish again, <laughs> immediately. I mean, at least he can tell his mates that he was technically a millionaire for a few minutes. <laughs> there was also a lot of silly stuff involving babies in hospitals, with some babies being recorded by the computer systems as being a hundred years old while only being about three hours old. You know, maybe that was the inspiration for Benjamin Button. Who knows? But imagine your son just being born and that very same day he's old enough to go out for a pint with his dad. A standard practice in Scotland. I'm actually 18. Although, sadly, there were more serious cases with a computer miscalculation error within a hospital in Sheffield, England. Apparently, due to the miscalculation of 154 pregnant women's age, they were given incorrect test results regarding the likelihood that their babies would have Down syndrome. This resulted in two terminations of babies that actually probably would have been fine, along with four mothers deciding to have their children who were then born with Down syndrome, because the results of their test had put them in the lower risk group, so they decided to continue with the pregnancy. So, was the Y2K bug an issue? Yes, yes it was, but it wasn't as bad as the media were making it out to be. But, in the same breath, it also could have been so much worse if all of those technicians and support groups hadn't fixed all of those issues. It has been said that because of all the forced refurbishments and more advanced hardware and software put in place to prevent further issues from happening, all of that actually helped with preventing 9-11 from being a lot more damaging than it already was. So, thankfully, we don't have to deal with any calendar-related computer issues. For now because there are more issues other than the year 2000. There is also the year 2038 problem, which I'm sure we'll deal with ahead of time, but no need to worry just now, that's ages away. Don't worry about it. But thank you to all of those very many technicians who sorted all of this out for us, because at the time, basically no one thanked them. Like, Nobody gave a shit about what all of the technicians did. You see, if someone says there's going to be a massive wide-scale issue that's also something that you can't physically see being fixed, then you would probably think that the issue was bullshit from the start. So that was the opinion that a lot of people had after the millennium struck. So basically, all of those programmers and so on got no recognition whatsoever for stopping Y2K. So, to summarise, Y2K wasn't a hoax, it was a very real thing, and it did have the potential to be very bad. But not as bad as the media were making it out to be. And the only reason it didn't get really bad was because of all of those poor bastard technicians and programmers pulling 80 hour weeks on practically zero sleep. So, well done. Hello. I have a comedy show at the end of this month in Birmingham. The one in Britain, like not not in the other country that doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, I, I've got a show, 30th of March in Birmingham. I'll put links to buy tickets down below so that you can buy tickets and come along to the show. It's me with uh, Darius Davies and Nico DeSanto, two very, very funny comedians. I mean, they're all right. Uh, but uh, yeah, come and see the three of us in Birmingham. I know it's Birmingham. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, right? But we we finally got a show outside of London with a venue that can actually that's actually brave enough to take us. So like you know that's nice. So yes, yeah, so I'll put uh, the link to buy tickets down below, and then you can come and uh, see me live 
and uh, realise what an awkward bastard I really am in real life. So uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Buy tickets. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.